ซาชีเฮเพคีจุกเชิงเมโตทาฮัมรีรับเลงยีนิเดเกียนพาดีสังเกชิงดูเมกเทอไวกีโดโคนันตาชิงลาเชพักโชเกตซุลามังดัมพ
But now the situation here that made it different um, in Denmark, while it may be uh, a, a, a less killing, uh, you also have to remember that um, you may not have the thought to actually kill. <laughs> um, and for us, uh, not that you, uh, okay, uh, how do I reword that? No, 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 no too much detail though. No de detail, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, next things, um, uh, so basically we, have, we need to create bucket loads of merit in living in vows. Um, and let's see, then we went into the purification practice, uh, the method to produce a marvelous human rebirth, okay, to become a, hum a marvelous human. Uh, let's see, we did some more review over the boy who loved fishing and the tragedy of it, um, that the boy who loved the fishing could not see the, the fish suffering. Uh, but on the other hand, the mother could, okay? That's and, enough, uh, now, just, the the more, just a rough outline, how much more? That's yeah. it. Okay, darling, that's wonderful, good. Purifying and renunciation, okay. Good, okay. good Tara, thanks a lot, darling. Okay. Okay, I, I mean, I, I, the last three weeks we have covered really everything. It really is covered everything. But it's like, a, but also like this kind of information, it takes a long time for us to internalize it, you know. We, and the reason for that is because we have this very powerful, you see, these words we've just been saying, actually, you think about it, it's intellectually not very complicated. It's not that complicated. So why it's difficult for us to hear it and why it's difficult for us to apply it is because in the mind, this is the real, the real point, because in our minds are deeply ingrained the exact opposite viewpoints. It's like, not as if our mind is completely open to a brand new idea. It's a bit like if you'd, if you'd been for eons thinking wrongly about mathematics, then you learn the right mathematics, you know, then you, you, would, um, you wouldn't be able to hear it because the resistance to it is so enormous. And that's why there's so much problem with hearing, hearing about karma, because we have, first of all, one of the commonest ones is the instinct to, to believe that somehow when you hear that we, that, you know, if, if you have suffering in this life, it's because you've done something bad in a past life. That's such a shocking concept to us. We, we absolutely find that absolutely shocking, especially, I mean, at a class we had this morning in Kathmandu, that, that this came up, you know, in a, um, that it's the commonest view is that somehow a child is innocent. We have an assumption very deep that a child, in, in fact, more than that in our culture, because we have the view, you know, forget whether God made you, that's one view. Another philosophical view we know is the view that, you know, is, is predominant in the world, which is the materialist view that your mother and father make you. So we, if we see evidence in children of terrible qualities, we are just convinced logically because of the, the system we use, because of the view we have that mother and father make the child, we assume there has to be something in the upbringing of the child that caused that. That's the first point. And then if we don't find any evidence of it, it's utterly confusing to us, naturally, because the philosophy we have is the mother and father create the child. So then, the, and so it's impossible for us, therefore, to hear that there can be something in the child that isn't that isn't coming from somebody else. This is very deep in our bones. So if we analyze that, that's the philosophy that we all actually believe in. You don't need to learn science to have that philosophy. The instinct, if we analyze how we feel, look at how we feel, let's analyze how we feel when we're accused of doing something wrong, even something as simple as that. It's completely shocking to us. We cannot stand it. It's not possible to think that we could have done something wrong. It's very shocking to us, you know? So when you have a child who's a lovely looking child, there's two things. One, you can have a child, we find, we find it very hard to believe that those, those terrible qualities in that child, somehow how they could be there, just doesn't seem possible. We're convinced they, that there's something terrible must have happened to them by other people to cause them to have this instinct to do something terrible. We can't believe it. And the other one that's shocking to us, if something happens bad to a child, there's two things, remember, the karma, one karma, one track of karma, as we've been discussing, is the tendency to do things. It's really just we come into this life, the Buddha's view, literally programmed with habits. It's really not a complicated concept. We are programmed with habits. 
So it's almost impossible. In fact, it's impossible for us to think that a child could have terrible habits, could do an, instinctively do something like be cruel or to torture. And the other karma we have is called experiences similar to the cause. It's absolutely shocking to us to hear that when a bad thing happens to a child, this is like shocking to us. Because why? Because we have a view that a child, we begin life as like a blank slate. There's a sort of an assumption like that in one sense, although the other hand, we say we're made by the parents and we come with their genes. So it's, again, it's shocking to us if we see there's some really good mother with no tendency to be unkind, but the child ends up becoming psychotic and harming other people. So it's utterly confusing to us because why? The concept of being reborn is not a very complicated concept, but it's shocking to us only because we have another view. That's why we keep bumping into these concepts of karma, because we have an other view instinctively. We assume you're born innocent. You assume that it's not your fault. You assume somebody else made you and put you on this earth. So it's kind of conflicting also, you know. <clears throat> I mean, I remember one time, remember 20, 20 odd years ago um, in Colorado, was it those Columbine kids, that school called Columbine, and two kids went on a rampage and murdered many children at school. So people read about them and saw their weird behavior. So there was this, this assumption that the parents must have been evil, has to have done something to them. But the, all the evidence showed that there were these nice white Christian parents. There was no blame anywhere. No one could believe it. I remember reading about the mother of one of them. The last 20 years has been a complete hell for her life because of the hate against her and her husband, the father of the child. They were totally blamed. They were the ones that everybody had to put their anger on. So why? Because they assume, they assume, the materialist model assumes the children were made by the parents and it's the parents' fault. This is very strong in our minds. We can see this. So if um, now I said, look at how we feel. Even if we don't have much scientific view about genes and DNA, with this, this is deep assumption. This is, the, this is the assumption of ego. That somehow we feel, somehow we're an innocent, when bad things happen to us, we feel we're an innocent victim. It's a very strong impulse, an intensely strong impulse. So when we hear that a child who looks nice and is a nice child, then has something terrible done to them, to hear that that child had karmic imprints in the mind from 57 lives ago when they were a rapist or a murderer, they must have, this is now they're, they're reaping, reaping the results of that. It's just too shocking for us. That's why we find it so hard to hear because we have an opposite view, but because also ego's view is very instinctive to, 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 to uh, be innocent somehow. It's very fascinating. But the other thing that I find most powerful and most difficult for us to um, think about karma is, 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 that, is, that, is that there are also causes for all the good things we experience. I think we really should analyze this. Let's analyze this today. It's totally fascinating. The law of karma is not complicated. It's not like hearing about emptiness where you really can't understand the concepts. It's actually really simple conceptually, not that many complicated concepts, that there is continuity of consciousness, everything a person does programs their mind, the negative things we do ripen as future suffering, the positive things we do ripen as future happiness. That's about it. That's not complicated. So, so this is what I'm, so I'm coming to here is the only time we ever think about karma in our lives is when bad things happen. I think this is the one that is totally, utterly grips me with fascination. Like I always say it, and I mean it very sincerely. I've never yet had a person use an example. I've never yet had a person ask this question. You mean to tell me, Rabina, that beautiful child with beautiful parents and good qualities and a beautiful education and lovely friends and only things good happen, only good things happen to her, 
You mean she deserves it? No one talks like that. You mean she created it? You mean she is the cause of that? Or even more, what, what, you know, what did she do to deserve this? It's too short. We don't think that. And the point is this. The point is this view of karma is based upon the, the, the very powerful view, the, the, the view of no karma, no cause and effect, is actually one of the deep misconceptions in the mind, according to the Buddha. We have a deep feeling that there are no causes for things. We know intellectually and scientifically everything has causes. We are brilliant at that. We are scientists. We're very good at understanding that if you've got a sick body, we know it's got to do usually with things that have happened to you, the food you've eaten. We see the connection. We see the logic to it. You know, but if a person, but we don't see it when it comes to emotional things. This is the, the really big difference. It's very fascinating. So the simple law of karma says, Every millisecond of what we label happy feelings, happiness, which is simply, forget about the more complex levels of happiness, but the simplest level of happiness, which is that when good things happen. Simple examples. Someone is kind to you. Someone tells you the truth. Someone believes your words. Someone gives you things. You have money in the bank. You have good health. These things, every single millisecond of these experiences, everyone is called a happy, a happy feeling, a pleasant feeling. It's generally what we describe as a happy life. We utterly understand this. And then we have a person with the exact opposite. Let's say two children. And there's a child who has un unkind parents, who is poor, who gets abused, who doesn't get believed, who gets harmed, who has no education, who doesn't get good food. There's two children with the exact opposite experiences. No, better example, use ourself. Much better example, use ourself. When good things happen, and then when bad things happen. So let's analyze our responses to those scenarios. Let's analyze our responses, how we, in a normal person, a person without practice, normally how we would respond to these things. So when the good things happen, you know, we wake up in the morning and then the food is on the table and mummy is in the kitchen and my sisters and brothers are there and my body is working okay and the sun is shining. The, we, it, the, the, the main response we have is we take it for granted. We, that's, we call that normal. That's like the baseline. That's what we think. That's how life should be. And so that implies if we take it for granted and think that's how life should be, it's, it assumes that somehow there's no cause. But when the bad thing happens and we stop in our tracks, and we go, oh my God, why did you do that to me? Your mother just was kind to you five minutes before, but you take it for granted, your mother's kind. But then your mother hits you, you're shocked. Why did that happen to me? But five minutes ago, she did one action, which was kind. Five minutes later, she does another action that is unkind. We don't respond even to the first one, but we have a mental breakdown with a second one. We need to analyze that. We need to analyze that. So it's a bit like you have a garden and you don't know anything about, and, and you have flowers growing all the time. You, you, and you don't know anything about, you know, about botany. So then you don't know there's such a thing as a cause for the flowers. You just assume flowers are there all the time. That's what it means taking something for granted. And that, that means is ignorance that clings to things as having a, an, a, an inherent nature, meaning no cause and effect, no cause and effect. It's just there. So that's one way to say. And then as soon as a weed grows, we have a complete mental breakdown. What is that weed doing there? Who put that weed in my garden? 
But a weed, for this view here, we know botany, a flower and a weed are identical from the point of view of both being the fruits of seeds. We know there's botany. There are causes. So when we understand causes, you under, so we, when we learn botany and then we start to see the vegetable growing and the flowers growing, you would, this is the point now, because you understand they come from causes and because you know it's your garden and you put the seeds in, then every single flower, every single vegetable, you would never take for granted for one second because you know you grew them, so you honor them, you treasure them, you remember your hard work, and you would never waste one single cauliflower, one single rose. So that's the way we are with our lives. We've never heard of karma. We, and there's another deep, whole deeper level to it as well. The, the view of ego grasping, the root delusion, just has this assumption it's just, this is the way things are. There's, we're very like ignorant and very thick and very unthinking. So we just grab things when they come with no thought there are causes. So you live in a nice life, the sky is blue, the food is on the kitchen table, you take it for granted. But when the bad stuff is there, how dare that happen to me? It's just, it's, in other words, it's completely illogical. There's no logic to it. Because we know, like the garden, they're all the product of causes. So when you know they are the product of causes, first, you know it's your garden, you planted the seeds. So if the weeds do come, you quickly own them and realize, oh my goodness, I made a mistake there. I allowed that weed to grow. Quick, let's pull it out. And then if the flowers are there, every day you look and you delight and you would not waste one of them. That's because you understand cause and effect. It's called botany. And that's the point about karma, you know. But underpinning this even more deeply is the, the, the delusions called attachment and aversion. So basically we've got the root delusion, which sees everything as self-existent. That means we take everything for granted. Then you've got attachment, which is the junkie in us that only ever wants the nice things. And that means it only ever wants what I want. And that is so ingrained in us, we don't even notice the thought process. In other words, deepen the bones of our being, being samsaric people, having this dualistic view that just everything is set in stone. We then have this intense emotional hunger, this neurotic junkie mind in us that's there every millisecond, that every second only wants the nice things, only wants what I want. So when the nice things come, you take it for granted. There's just this, in other words, attachment is an assumption. Attachment is an assumption that I deserve the good things. So when they come, we take them for granted. This is normal. We call it normal. And as soon as the unnice things come, as soon as someone's unkind, as soon as you have a pain in your head, as soon as the smallest thing that happens that is not what attachment wants, that millisecond is the arising of aversion, anger. And that is the assumption, how dare bad things happen to me. In fact, they're really heavy duty states of mind. This is where how they deepen our bones, you know? I mean, these are so deep, we don't ever express attachment and aversion like this. So because of this deep kind of the sense, in other words, attachment is an incredible sense of entitlement. You know, sometimes when you see very selfish people, very demanding, very arrogant, they just assume they deserve good things. They barge in front. They put themselves first. That's the expression of attachment. It's a deep assumption that I only deserve good things, that it's my right to get good things. So you greedily demand them and want them and assume they should come. It's like a, an incredible sense of entitlement. No concept 
no concept at all that this is the point about cause and effect that i have played any role at all in those good or bad things happening it's like that garden in the backyard it's somehow you're just born with it it's self-existent and you just deserve the flowers and you do not deserve the weeds and this really is the assumption this dualistic view of the eye which gives rise to this attachment that give rise to this aversion it's really quite schizophrenic lami yeshi would often use that word don't be a shock you know there's a feeling, and this is the feeling of ego, we say the words even, I didn't ask to get born, it's not my fault. So that is a, a deep assumption, even if you don't know about eggs and sperms and, bot and biology and things. There's just this feeling that we're innocent victims, there's this feeling that we only deserve the good things and don't deserve the bad. So this is the point about the assumption of deserve and not deserve. It's a really powerful view. I deserve people to be kind to me, we think. And we get brutally injured. I mean, this is the fact is, this is not criticism. These are why we suffer. This is Buddha's analysis of why we suffer so terribly. And the suffering we experience is genuine suffering. That's why people have mental breakdowns, go crazy. Don't be sarcastic about it. This is why sentient beings suffer, because of these assumptions. So there's a feeling of having you know, like the feeling of having no cause and effect in our life is just like the feeling that your garden in the backyard, somehow, you know, you say, you woke up in the morning and you'll go, well, where are the flowers? Why hasn't someone put flowers in my garden? Now, we know that's absurd because we know it's my garden. So the feeling of having no karma is that somehow we were made by someone else. Mummy and daddy made me. They chose to make me. They didn't consult me, I tell you. And they plonk you on this earth with no choice. And then bad things and good things seem to happen to you randomly. Although we demand the good and we can't stand the bad. Buddha would simply say that's really gross ignorance it's genuine misconception it's not like that he says you created your garden so if you know it's your garden and this is my point you would never look in the garden and say how dare there be weeds in my garden that assumes doesn't it that someone else put weeds in your garden so that's how we feel about suffering, that someone else gave me suffering and I don't deserve suffering. And then we also believe someone else had better give me happiness every single second. I had better had flower, I had better have flowers and vegetables in my garden because I deserve vegetables and flowers. This is how we feel when it comes to happiness and suffering. It's kind of fascinating. You would not feel that if you didn't play the, if you didn't learn to play the piano or if you were lazy in your practice, you wouldn't, you'd know you were responsible for not being good at piano. And if you are good at piano, you know you are responsible because you created the pianist. But we don't know that we are the ones who create the suffering person and create the happy person. So that's why it's so hard for us to think about karma, to take it on board and not and to even intellectually understand it. And then of course, a thousand times harder to apply it second by second by second. So all it's pointing to is the depth of the misconceptions in the bones of our being at the level of complete and total and utter belief. That's why practice is so difficult, you know. So that's why we've got to at least get it clear intellectually, open our minds to this possibility the Buddha might be speaking the truth. We don't know yet, we haven't proven it. So we take it as our hypothesis. So we apply it every day. And this is why just beginning to practice at this first level, abiding by the laws of karma, deciding I will not kill and I will not steal and I will not lie first, because I know I do not want future suffering. This first level has got zero 
to do with compassion. This most of us miss. You think that's inferior. You think that's selfish. You've got to go there first. You've got to know you create yourself. When you know you create yourself, then you, you will be energized to make sure you don't create a suffering person. So you will definitely decide not to kill, not to steal, not to lie. And you will be happy to live in vows of not killing and stealing. And you will be happy to purify every day. It will give you great pleasure because you know you do not want future suffering. That has, that's the meaning of the beginning of renunciation. If we haven't got that, our compassion cannot be that strong because compassion is absolutely rooted in this clear view of karma. So it really takes us time, you know. I mean, we're not even, I'm not even going to many details about it, but nuts and bolts about it, which we need to learn by studying your course notes, by studying the Lamb Rim. It's the general idea of it that for me, I'm trying to get across to us and trying to start trying to um, give us some enthusiasm to understand, you know. But it's very shocking to us. But and, and so the other points again, shocking because we assume attachment assumes we only deserve good things. And aversion, anger, which is what arises when bad things happen, is an assumption. How dare that happen to me? I don't deserve it. It's very powerful. We can hear our minds, you know, and we can see this is the basis of such torment, such suffering among human beings, you know, when bad things happen to us. It's a hubris when good things happen to us. So let's analyze what it means I deserve and don't deserve, because we use it in a very heavy way, you know. Well, we know, like the, the flowers example, we know, using this word in a simple sense, that if you do your gardening every day, you do deserve the vegetables and flowers. You know that. If you want to use that word deserve, the deserve is, is that you did do it. You did the work, so you get the result. You work hard at work, so you deserve a salary. We understand that. That's reasonable. And if you don't put your seeds in the garden and you don't do the weeding, then you could argue that you deserve the weeds. But we hear that as punishment. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that deserve is the wrong word anyways. It's, it's got a real simple meaning, but we put a very heavy moralistic meaning on it. So that's why when we hear that, that some person, harm, you know, um, how, uh, some person, we hear that the Buddha says, if a bad thing happens to me, we go, oh, well, then I must deserve it, then I'd better suffer. And we see it as the opposite. I mean, if someone else, if someone else is something bad happens, and we hear that it's because of their past karma, our usual mistaken view of karma is, well, if they deserve it, then let them suffer. That's how heavy we feel about deserve and not deserve. We misuse it terribly. So when a bad person, when a bad thing happens to a person who's harmed another, we are glad they suffer. They deserve it, we say. So we've got that view already. That's not the Buddha's view. We've made that up. It's this heavy, vindictive view we have. Or if there's somebody, and we hear the Buddha say, everybody wants to be happy. And then you think of your ex-boyfriend who really did harm you. So the first response is, what do you mean he wants to be happy? He doesn't deserve happiness. And that's how our lives are. If you have a relationship with somebody and you're really attached to them and they're attached to you, then you love them, you want them to be happy because they deserve your love. But the moment my boyfriend starts cheating on me, my love will turn off like a tap. He no longer deserves it. So that's heavy, but that's how we think. 
It's that's why we think if a child is innocent and they get harmed, it is outrageous to us to think that they quote unquote deserve it. It's too much for our poor brains, you know. But the biggest one, like I said before, is we take happiness for granted, which means we see it as self-existent. We see it as having no causes. It's just my right. That's why the only time we agonize about karma is when the bad things happen. I remember one guy asking about the bad things happen, talking about a child, and I gave him the example of a happy child with a happy family, like I just did before. And I said, what's the cause of that? He looked puzzled. He didn't know what I meant because we only think bad things. When it comes to karma, we only think somehow bad things happen, and that's therefore karma. We don't think it's, the, it's good things. So the thing is, when we really begin to apply the law of karma every day, it becomes really dynamic for us. And this is really advanced. Most of us aren't like this. Every single second, any good thing is happening, which simply means waking up without a headache, having a glass of milk, having someone smile at you, having the vegetables taste nice. I mean, the tiniest things. Every second of those happy feelings, every one of those happy feelings, and as many moments in a day that you label happy, happy feeling, as many moments as there are, each one of those happy feelings is the fruit of a past virtuous seed you planted in your mind by doing a virtuous action every second of happy feelings, every second. So every second we have a happy feeling and we've just bought, got the fruit of a virtue and we take it for granted and greedily eat it up like those vegetables and assume I will get another vegetable because it's my human right. Then you completely tip your virtuous karma down the toilet. This is the tragedy. You know? Just like that veggie garden. You eat up all the vegetables and you are shocked when they run out. Why aren't there more vegetables in my garden, you know? So it's quite heavy. We waste our human life in misinterpreting the happy experiences because we so hungrily want them. Attachment is a junkie that only wants happy feelings. It can't bear anything else, you know? It's very deep in our bones. It's deeply instinctive, primordially deep in our bones. So it's kind of like we have to wake up. And when we can start to realize any tiny good thing that happens is the fruit of incredible virtue, you know? Then we would be joyful every second. And the real point is this, like the veggies in the garden, every time you eat that cauliflower, you make sure you grow another cauliflower. You don't just use it up and hope it comes and think it's going to come from its own side. You know it's your responsibility to grow another cauliflower because it runs out. So karma is this very dynamic thing. You know, every time you have a moment of happiness, you've just finished that seed. So you've got to grow more seeds. So the first way to grow more seeds is already even have the interpretation of the happiness as the fruit of your past virtue and delight in it. That already does not waste that fruit. And then you offer it to others. You see it as empty. You grow more of it. You delight. You feel humble. And you keep growing more virtue because you know you want happiness. This is just bare bones, ordinary level, not more advanced then life is much more dynamic for us. And when we own responsibility for every tiny moment of happiness every single day, then when the suffering moments do come, we're more, we've got more equanimity. We understand it now that's the fruit of a delusion. And we will interpret it differently. And we will not be so shocked. There won't be the view, how dare that happen to me? I don't deserve it. You won't have that view eventually. And that's the interesting point. The more and more we hear Buddha's teachings, we're hearing that one is the event and two, there is our interpretation of the event. So one, there's a pain in the knee. 
Two, if you've got lots of attachment, you will have lots of aversion, lots of upset. How dare this happen to me? Constantly attached to finding a method to get rid of the headache, the, the knee ache. And the real reason we're suffering is not the knee ache, it's the interpretation. This is the one that really is quite sobering to hear. If we have happy moments, especially if you, you know, you've got a your wonderful friend, like you're in love with somebody, we know the anxiety of losing that person is tremendous, you know. The pain of having an attachment object brings the suffering of, of thinking of terrified of losing it, which brings incredible possessiveness, fear of losing, and it becomes incredible suffering, in fact. But if you have the understanding it's due to past karma, that you caused it, you'll be more relaxed about it and you'll enjoy it more. You'll be more joyful and you'll make sure you keep creating more of it, not just holding on to it because you're terrified of it going. So in other words, your life completely changes when you change your interpretation from the belief that there's just life is good luck and bad luck or that somebody else's responsibility from that view to the view of karma, already huge changes occur in your life when you start to, apply it every day to your suffering and your happiness. Your life completely changes. It's a whole different approach to life, you know? And that's the application of this philosophical view. You don't just leave it in the books or leave it in your head, you know? Nothing will change that. It's just cold knowledge. So it takes time to apply karma every second, you know? And again, this is where the analogies, for example, like, you know, you get diabetes. So, you know, I mean, look at the way we are with nutrition now, with physical health. We are unbelievably cautious about what we put into our mouths. Unbelievably cautious. We'll read every tiny label. We'll make sure we eat certain things. It runs our lives. And I'm using that as an analogy because you understand the dynamics of cause and effect for food and illness, food and good health. You know you want good health. You know you don't want ill health. So you're going to watch what you put in your mouth like a hawk. That's the way to practice with the law of karma. Every second you think something, say something, and do something, you're dropping seeds into your bank vault. You're dropping karmic seeds. And that will either be negative or positive. That's it, basically. There are some neutral, but not, don't even think about neutral now. So if you had handfuls of seeds in your hand and you dropped seeds into your garden all day and you know about botany, you would be frantic to check that the only seeds you plant would be good ones because you know you can't bear the thought of planting more weeds, more poison, more poison fruits and things. You wouldn't stand that. You'd be anxious all day. So that shows how long it takes for us to be conscious about karma, to use it as a tool, to be, to be watching ourselves like a hawk every single second and to, for it to become completely natural. We can see it takes time, you know, which is why it is these marvelous tools they give us, one, to live in vows, that it's like putting atomic bombs under the habits to kill and lie and steal. So you're really easily getting ahead of the game. And you're constantly, as long as you've got that vow, ticking over virtuous karmic seeds 24 hours a day. It's like, it's like you, you, your fruits and veggies are being sown in the garden every, every second of the day while you're asleep. You have machines dropping seeds into your garden 24 hours a day. Wow, that's a good tool to have. That's vows. And then at the end of the day, you put atomic bombs under the tendencies and when you do the purification practice. So these are the most brilliant tools, easy to apply, rooted in the concept of karma, which help us turn ourselves into a marvelous person, which is exactly what we want to become. Of course, it takes time, this view, only because it's so different from how we, what we believed until now, you know. So really, we've got to think about it carefully, analyze it carefully, look into it carefully, and, and then apply it with a happy mind, you know. And then just the applying it in daily life brings radical change. Like I said, it loosens the grip of ego grasping. It loosens the attachment. It loosens the, this, this hubris. It loosens the entitlement. It loosens the anger. We become more grown up. We become more accountable. We become more content. We become feeling more in charge of our life. 
not a victim of circumstances, which is how we suffer so badly, you know. So it's really quite profound as we keep applying it, practicing it, second by second. That's the summary. So we've finished, really. Now you have some questions. Come on. Okay, Cyril, talk to me. Uh, yes, uh, very well, Rabina. Uh, you say, why, if we see a moment of happiness as empty, we don't use up that virtuous seed? That's a really good point. Or even, not even just that, put it this way, a more broad point, Cyril, is, is that the moment we understand even that it's karma, forget about emptiness, even that it's the fruit of a virtue. See, the, the usual view, the ignorant view is the greedy mind, I deserve it, give me more. So that's very intense, very greedy. And because, this is the point really, Cyril, because that is a misconception, it, it, it's, it, it ruins the seed. It's a misconception. But by understanding it's the fruit of karma is the beginning of changing our view. And then by understanding even it has no intrinsic nature, this puts atomic bombs under it because the final purification of all negative results, the final purification that stops negative results coming or stops us growing more negative seeds is the realization of emptiness. So we've got to think that through. It's a really good question, you know, because the, the reason is it's because it's not accurate. It's almost a simple way to put it. It's because no cause and effect is inaccurate. N intrinsic nature is inaccurate. And because it makes us greedy and mindless and self-centered, that is one of the consequences of it. So then the grasping at it. Okay, so let's analyze. Let's just think of, um, it's such a good question. Let's just think of eating your food. So we know how we, we talk about um, Lama Zopa gives us all these methods from the Bodhisattva path that we can use to redeem our attachment, for example. So the typical, the first level of approach of giving up attachment, let's say to your delicious cake, in the very first level of practice, the Pati Moksha level, is just don't eat much cake. Be very disciplined, have a small amount, and don't get too overexcited. But in the Bodhisattva path, this is Lama Zopa spends all his time doing this, he gives us methods of adding compassion into the mix. So now, this is the key. The key factor and we've discussed this with karma, that determines whether that action of eating cake it leaves a negative seed in your mind or leaves a positive seed in your mind. One isn't the eating of the cake, but is the motivation that, in, that, that you put in there that then before eating the cake. So that's the key. Now, the point is here, that's proving dependent arising. So let's, let's, I think of it like this. You know, there's like you, everything that exists, every phenomenon, every event, every action, everything is a dependent arising. And every one of them, one way they are dependent arising is they consist of parts. So let's put in, let's, I always think of the parts as like a little, several bricks that make up one small thing. So one brick is the intention, one brick is the motivation, one brick is the action, and one brick is the result. Now, right there, there's one, one person eating cake, the same situation, the same cake, the object is there, the intention is there, a motivation is there, the action is there, and the result is there. But the one difference for one person, attachment is the main motivation. The other person, attachment's there, but before they eat it, they put another little brick in, squeezing it next to the attachment brick, and it's called emptiness. It's called compassion. Well, look at those two, two, in, two things. They're different phenomena now, aren't they? One has only has four bricks and one has five bricks in it, and one of those bricks is, is called compassion. It's now a new entity that proves there's no inherent negative or positive action. It's up to the motivation. So every time you add another thought, you add another brick. So you make it a different action. So that so then you, the more you have compassion, the more you think of it as no inherent nature, and you finally have no attachment in there at all, that action is literally a virtuous action. You eat the same cake, you put it, you intend to, you put it in the mouth, 
and it goes in your stomach. The one thing that's different is the motivation that changes one action into, it causes one action to be a negative one because of attachment, because it's done greedily and it's self-centered and it's self-existent and the other person puts compassion or wisdom in. So it's literally another entity. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The analogy, the, the picture, the, you know, the, the picture of it. So that's what dependent arising means. Everything's got parts. So every thought that's in there is one of the parts. And the key part that determines negative or positive action is the, is the motivation. So eating the cake, before you shove it in the mouth, thinking it's empty, thinking it has no inherent nature, thinking of not having an attachment, thinking of eating it with compassion, it's a dramatically different action and will bring dramatically different results. Because the training of your mind, even just having the thought of emptiness, is the cause of realizing emptiness eventually. Mm. Whereas the thought of attachment increases the greed, increases the grasping, increases the self-centeredness, and increases the concrete mind. Do you see? Yes, I understand. And the other thing that you said also is, is uh, why um, uh, compassion is rooted in a deep understanding of karma. What did yes. you exactly mean by that? This is the whole point. Let me tell you, it's exactly the point, Cyril. Okay. Right now, without thinking about karma and the usual view we have of the world, which is all these innocent victims, and I'm being sarcastic when I say it, but it's kind of like that. We know, and then second, looking at the four noble truths, and the first noble truth, there are three kinds of suffering. And the first kind of suffering is called the suffering of suffering. And we know that one, that's when the bad things happen. Now, if we look at the world, Cyril, automatically the only people we have compassion for are the innocent victims, which is when the bad things happen. We don't have compassion for the harmer. We don't have compassion for happy people. And we don't have a compassion for rich people. We only have compassion for the poor, the harmed, the beaten, because we the only view we have of suffering is the first kind. Now you go to the second scope, you learn about the suffering of change, which is the suffering of attachment. Mm. So the whole world has that. To the rich people, the beautiful people, the people for whom happy things are happening, you actually have more compassion for them because with their attachment, they're using up all their virtue and tipping it down the toilet. So it's, it's a hidden suffering. So when you understand the second kind of suffering, the suffering of change, you'll have unbelievable compassion for the rich people, unbelievable compassion for the people blindly following attachment, thinking finally I've found happiness, when in fact it is ending and will go right back to the suffering of suffering when it runs out. So we're all like as blind as bats. And then you have the understanding of the, of the suckless level of suffering, which is the all-pervasive suffering, which is the suffering of having ego grasping. So when you have that level of understanding the three kinds of suffering, you will have compassion for every living being in the universe. And that, and understanding karma, why a person, for example, or, you, you know, gets harmed in the future, or why a person harms. We're happy to have compassion for the victims. But then suddenly when you understand karma, you have compassion for all the harmers, all the monsters, all the pedophiles, all the psychopaths. Because you realize the victim is just finishing their suffering and the harmer is just beginning countless lives of future suffering. That's the logic why karma, without understanding karma for ourselves and all the levels of suffering, it's impossible to have compassion for everybody, only the victims. It's too limited. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. This is why the compassion wing is more advanced. It's not the compassion we have, which is sort of sentimental compassion, and only for a small group of people, because it's based on innocent victim, and therefore it's based on anger. The moment we have compassion, we then, who are we going to blame? So it's the blame mode. Whereas this view, they say the bodhisattvas have more compassion for the harmers because out of their ignorance, compelled by their past negativity, they are going to create, they're creating unbelievable future suffering for themselves. My feeling is, you know, a mother has that. You know, pedophiles have a mother. Everybody hates the pedophile, but the mother, she knows this boy, she loves this boy, and she can see he's harming himself. That's the point about karma. When, and we cannot realize that, Cyril, until in the first level of practice, we've understood karma and the, the heartbreaking fact that I am the cause of my own suffering. 
then you, it's almost like that's what bringing compassion to yourself instead of beating ourselves up, you know. And then we can have it for others because we're all in the same boat. You understand? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril, very much. Yes, questions, please. Uh, Freddie? Yes, Freddie. Hello there. Um, so in order to plant the karmic seeds, we have to have the intent. What if, let's say you're at the grocery store and you see an elderly person fall in the aisle. You don't, you react. You either stop and help immediately. You stand a little bit back and watch and see what's happening. Will they help themselves? Or you just keep walking because I've got a list and I got to get going. That's right. The person who is stopping to help immediately, is that necessarily positive karma because they didn't stop and say, oh, I'm going to intend to help them so I can plant a good exactly. seed? So, Freddie, this is really, this point is, is actually pointing out the view we made before that because something happens automatically we assume there's no cause but the point is darling everybody comes into this life programmed with intentions so the person who is automatically kind is because they program their mind from being kind so they just they, it, it looks like there's no intention and the person who's more selfish because they're more tendency to be self-centered. So that's their intention. So if there's, in other words, if there's not intention, the, the mental factor called I will, that's the first step in everything we do. But 99% of the time we follow our habits, but that's just because we programmed our mind. So yes, there is intention. You would not do it if there weren't, but it's so automatic. It's virtually instinctive. And that's why we can change our intentions. I will not be selfish. I will wait and help this person. That's when you notice it because it's tough. But everything is driven by intention. They it would not happen if it weren't there. It's just that it sounds to us like a very volitional word. It is volition. And it's there every millisecond. As Lama Zopa says, everything exists on the tip of the wish. But the tragedy is, especially with the delusions, well, let's say delusions, we're autom we automatically, it's just programmed. So that's why we never question. And we can see some people who are kind, we just say, oh, that's just natural. And that really is implying there's no cause for it, but there is a cause. They've practiced that before. That's what's marvelous. You see my point, Freddie? There's Freddie gone, she disappeared. I can't see. Yes, thank you. I understand. You see what I'm saying? It's totally instinctive, darling. I mean, this is how it is. That's why it's very humbling. Oh, I can't hear you. We, Sorry, just, think, oh, we just think, oh, that's just a bad, it's just who I am, we say. It's just who I am, good or bad. No, you've programmed your mind with those good inten that intention followed by the action. You've programmed your mind by the self-centeredness and followed by the action. That's how we have, that's why we can change. So it's very humbling to see this. You know, most of what we do is even, even, even you know, scratching ourselves, you get an itch. We'd actually call that an itch. But that also is still coming from intention. If there weren't the thought intention, your hand would not go to scratch yourself. It couldn't do it. So it's to we're totally programmed. It's quite primordial from life to life. And that's, of course, why you can see if we look carefully at little children. I always remember, you know, when you read about um, suffering people, we don't like to think about kids having bad habits. But I remember reading about one of these serial killers years ago, and he talked about how when he was a tiny little boy, he didn't know why he wanted to do it. He was compelled to torture the creatures. His mother didn't teach him because he was programmed with that habit. You know, this is what's very humbling about it. But then we can know we can change our habits, which, of course, is why it's hard work. Do you understand, Freddie? She's gone. Again. May I ask one more question? Good, good, good. Um, yeah. On a, same with karma, but different. Okay. So, what? 
how do you cleanse your karma if god forbid you were in a car accident and killed somebody you take the vows i'm not going to kill somebody and there's a tragic accident you couldn't see it but how do you cleanse your heart because such a heaviness will carry your entire life at least for most people i understand that time because we have terrible guilt the thing is like with actions like that a complete action of killing has to consist of several components the first has to be intention. The second has to be a motivation. The third is the object is there. The fourth is you do it. Now, in those cases, when you, I think in some cases, forgive me, you can say there was no intention. Somebody ran their car into you. I mean, my sister, she was parked in the middle of the road on a dark night, about to turn into her driveway, and a motorcyclist drove into the back of her she had no intention to kill there was no motivation she said she had more grief than when she than when she gave birth to a dead child she said it was absolutely unbearable now that's because of the karma between two people but there's no killing karma you can purify because you've got some karma with that person but you had you only break a vow when you strongly intend that's when strong that's when intention has to be very strong when the strong intention to do it and strong motivation, I don't care, it doesn't matter. So it's rare to break a vow like that. That's not breaking a vow. And that's due to some some kind of karma from ages ago, but there's no motivation and there's no intention in that case. Very clear. Do you understand? Of course, still purify because you've got some karmic connection with that person, but there's no fault there. You can't say there is. Good, darling. I mean... In a subtle way, they do talk about the some kind of subtle kind of imprint left in the mind. But you know, that's why it's anyway excellent to purify all the time. So we clean up all the things, you know. So yes, uh, Resham, hello. Is that Resham? Yes, talk to me. Hello, Venerable. Hello. Um, I had a question around, what if someone is born or someone has a mental disorder? I have three questions around it. The first one is that, um, how does karma work in their case? Does it get exhausted by living through that? Uh, and what happens like, so do they create more karma because you know they are in that mental state and they probably don't know what they're doing? So are they creating more karma? And what happens to them when they die? I understand, darling. I mean, in, it's really hard to give a general answer, but let's just try and be general. So there's two things that could happen. One is, let's it's the same question, for example, the purification of it. Let's say a bad thing happens to somebody. That is definitely the purification of some karma you created. That's why if we can have that view, it can help us with courage to bear the suffering because we know we're finishing the karma. But it's also often the same with people who are very suffering mentally and have to be taken care of and have to have, you know, put in places and looked after because they can't be on their own. You could argue often that's very much a purification for that person. It depends on the person, you know, and it depends on, on the mind. I mean, if somebody's completely paranoid and thinks they're Mozart every day and have to be locked up because they go kill people, that's quite difficult tendencies. That's quite strong for that person. But even still, that's the suffering of that is so unbearable that, I mean, you could argue they don't, I mean, there has to be imprints in the mind. There's no question about that. There are karmic imprints, but, you know, um, but again, it depends on the person, depends so much. For example, I mean, it's another type of thing, but it's an interesting example. You know, many times people who really practice, what we start to find is we think our minds are getting worse. We think we're getting more crazy and more angry and more jealous. Well, I always use the example of our friend Roger, a monk for years and years doing many long, long retreats. And you'd think a person doing retreats, you somehow get better, you know, but he has had this unbearable, intense levels of rage and arrogance. And he was really quite freaked out about it. And he went to Lama Zopa and Mache laughed and laughed and laughed and said, fantastic, the dirt has to come out. So in one way, if in our ordinary daily life, there's two things. One is you're just sitting there and you feel anger and annoyed, but you struggle with it. But another time you get angry and you follow the anger, they're very different situations. If it arises out of the, it's like dirt coming up to the surface, but you don't follow it and you struggle with it, that's purification, definitely. But if you have the anger and then believe it and follow it through, that's when you create negative karma. So we shouldn't be afraid of our minds. 
And that's if we're trying to work on our minds, you know, because I mean, the junk comes to the surface and we're seeing it more clearly. Then we can really learn to struggle with it. That's purification, that's great. But often with people who have mental illness, it can be purification for sure. It's not always the same for everybody. I mean, or even an example, like my, I always quote my friend on death row in Kentucky, he's a Buddhist, Mitchell, he's very amazing. And one of the friends on death row, I know because I have met him, he said, Rabina, he thinks of torture all the time. So you could, you could definitely say that's mental illness. He was, but he was born with a tendency from past, past negative karma. He has no control over it. It's just there all the time. So you could argue the imprints are very strong in his mind. There's no question he's creating more imprints because he can't stop the thoughts. But at least he's not torturing people. I mean, he, you know, he's not doing the harm. But he's harming his own mind terribly, yes. And that's the tragedy of being born with very strong habits. Because our trouble is whether they're good habits or bad habits, and that's the, what, the point with Freddie, we tend to take these habits for granted. Well, I'm just this kind of person. What can I do, you know? But no, they're habits. They're habits. So we have to watch all. But with, and so with people like you know, the, the first, your first point, the second point, there could be purification. And then this is where it's so important to protect them from harming themselves and others. And it very much depends on how you, you help them live their life whether they get a good human rebirth or not. It's quite complex. There's many things that involve. So it's a person who's crazy and can't take care of themselves. If you surround them by sounds of Dharma and you try to take care of them and you, and you practice love and compassion and they're surrounded by goodness and they hear many mantras, that could help definitely get a decent human rebirth, even though their minds are crazy, you know? Do you understand, darling? Thank you, Gershom. Yes, Salo. Yes, Salo. Hello, Venerable Rubina. Thank you very much for your teaching. Okay. Um, my my question, I don't really know how to how to say it, but it's about the track of karma of experiences similar to the cause. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that that um, that track of karma determines our, our experiences in the hands of others. Usually, like that, exactly, exactly. Does that also determine the suffering? or the happiness we will experience when we are faced with that experiences? Do you understand? Well, okay, what I'm hearing is, yes, there are two things. One is a person, um, a person smiles at you, which is called, so that action, that means between the two of you, that moment, that person seeing you, you, they cause them to be happy and they smile at you. So you're receiving a smile is the fruit of a virtue. Absolutely. It's because I smiled to that person. What? It's because I smiled to that well, I mean, person. Speaking simply, okay? Whatever action that someone does towards you, you are one of the main causes of why they do it to you. Now, let's say it's your girlfriend and you adore her. So naturally it will trigger very beautiful feelings, won't it? But if it's a pedophile smiling at you, it will not trigger pleasant feelings. So it very much depends on how you interpret the person and blah, 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 you can say like that. So in general, anything any person or ant or dog or rat does in relation to you, if, they, if they're mean to you, that's the fruit of your harming them. If they're kind to you, that's the fruit of your being kind to them. Broadly speaking, that's, that's the way karma works. And as to how you respond, I mean, if you're paranoid and everybody smiles at you, but you think they're all kind of kill you, then clearly you won't have good feelings, you know? Right, right. So, so karma does not, does not always necessarily, I mean, I mean virtuous, virtuous actions does not necessarily bring bring happiness results, but bring just- No, 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 virtuous actions uh, will definitely cause you to be smiled at, seen as nice, given things, the sun to shine on you, but uh, as to how you respond to it, I mean, if you're mentally ill, you, you don't know how to interpret it, so you, you're weird. Or if you've got a big fat, let's say you love chocolate cake, so you, you get chocolate cake as a result of your past virtue, but you can get anything at all. But if, you've got, if you're sick and you eat chocolate cake, it'll make you vomit. So your response to it is another discussion. Right, that's more about delusions or... Well, it depends on how you respond. Whereas if, let's say, you're really practicing and a person is mean to you and you are happy because you just purified your negative karma, that's where your choice comes into it, where your practice comes in, you know? Right. 
Because finally, the usual response is when someone is nice to us, our attachment is triggered and we get all happy and we grasp at the person. When someone is mean, we get angry and we push the person away. That's the usual one, you know. So that's why to realize one is having a knee ache, we assume I must be angry if my knee hurts. No, it's up to us to interpret it differently. That's when we're in control of it, when we can really use everything as purification then. Hmm. Do you understand? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, that made it really clear. Good, okay. So yes, Thanks. Samuel, yes, hello there. Hello, my dear. Uh, hello, uh, my question is, what should we start with? Is it wrong not to perform negative actions or to go and perform positive actions? Well, this is the first level of practice, the junior school, as I call it, the first scope of practice. The logic being, because we're driven by old habits and have no awareness whatsoever, because we're driven by anger and attachment, the absolutely first level of practice is at least don't harm. So if you come into this life with no thought to harm, then you'll already be ahead of the game and you'll be able to immediately benefit without effort. So clearly we're going to first stop harming, control our body, control our speech. Then we go to the next level and control attachment and anger. And then we're qualified now to have confidence that we can really do proper actions to help others that are based on wisdom and compassion. So it's a logical progress. Does that make sense? Mm, but uh, hmm? actions such as not act, but actions such as saving lives or trying to unite friends that quarrel, uh, which step do they fall upon in this progress? I don't understand your question. Like, like the, the opposite voice keeps disappearing. I don't hear the whole question. Uh, the opposite of killing. Killing is saving life, right? So say, then, what's the question? Where does saving life fall at? But that's answering your first question, isn't it? The first level is a first thing we have to be cautious of is to not harm. And then we've got that under control, we will happily help. But if you've got the tendencies to do lots of harm, it'll be more hard for you to help others. So it all depends on the situation and the time. But in general, the progression has to be, and I mention it again, again, because we're yeah. ordinary samsaric beings, because we're driven by attachment and aversion, and because the servants of our attachment and aversion run the show, body and speech, our main concern is at least prevent ourselves from harming. Now, that doesn't mean you can't leap in and help somebody straight away. Of course you can. It's just showing the levels of practice if we take them according to our capacity. Does that not answer your question? Yeah, right. Good. Yeah, it, it, it did. It did. Good. It did. Good, good, good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And yes, Nina. Hello. Um, is the severity of the karmic result depending on the type of object? So, if the motivation, the action, and the result of the um, action that I perform, if it's all the same, but the object is, for example, um, an animal or human being is no, I think very much the, the object does make it play a big role and I think it's in a sense common sense if you if you think let's say I mean I think an ant let's say if you if you have to choose if you say you have to choose between saving an ant and saving a human with the purest motivation we most likely better to save the human because the human being as a human has more opportunity to use their intelligence and to develop some qualities and be of use to others so yes yes definitely the object is more heavy so when you take the vow not to kill you kill the killing vow is broken in a major way if you intentionally kill a human and you only break it in a minor way if you intentionally kill like an ant or something so yes the object does make a difference definitely okay and then it's not based on that some lives are more or less worth but it's based on that humans have the possibility to develop more. Yeah, because in the, the bottom line is every living being wants to be happy. No living being wants to suffer. Every living being uh, has Buddha nature. But at a certain time, you've got to make choices sometimes, you know. Or if, if, if yes, 
And, and the another thing that plays a big role in the karma we create is, is, the, is the, let's say a negative action of killing is the way we do it. If you get enormous pleasure and you torture a person, that's clearly much heavier, you know? So, I mean, it's so many things. The heaviness of the action is determined by the way you do it and the strength of your motivation. And the heaviness is also determined by the object. Definitely those, yes, mm -hmm. definitely. The wish is not to harm anybody, of course, but we, we do our best, you know. But yes, karma is very dependent on the person. In my sense, even you could think, let's say, anyway, no, that's enough. I think that's okay. I think good thing to think about. Good point. Thanks, Nina. Thanks. Christian, yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh, sorry. No, Christian, is it? Is my... Christian first, then Julie. Oh, okay. Uh, hello, Venerable. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's maybe just a technical point, but um, I understood that um, your karmic action also uh, results in either happy or um, uh, happy or unhappy feelings. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and what category does it fall into of the four um, uh, four results? Uh, being first the body, the second your mind, the third. Well, yes, because a happy being. result, the fully ripened result of a non-killing action a fully ripened result of a non-killing action would bring the happy result of a human birth as opposed to a dog birth. The, the, also, the result would be the tendency to not kill. Then the third one would be you don't get killed or die young. And the fourth is your body would be healthy and the, 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 the environment nourishes you. They're considered, relatively speaking, happy results. What I mean is the happy feelings, because the happy feelings are also a result, right? Yeah, absolutely. Feel I, every, I, millisecond. every millisecond, there's a feeling one kind or another. Yeah. Every millisecond. So you could be sitting there just having a happy feeling. That's the fruit of one action. And is it, I was just wondering, is, is that happy feeling, does it fall into the category of the of the mind? So the uh, the second type of result, or does it fall into the oh, category of experience? Itself, you, mean? you mean a happy feeling itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A happy feeling itself is the mind. Uh -huh, happy okay. feeling itself is the mind. So I was I mean, just wondering, yeah. No, no, that's a good, it's a totally important question. And that's mm -hmm. why technically, if we say happiness, I think because we're so addicted to believing the cake is the cause of it, we think the cake is the happiness. Do you understand? We think the cake is the cause. And even we think the cake is the happiness. When we mm -hmm. think about a happy time, we think about the object. But happiness technically is a state of your mind. It's either sensory or mental consciousness. Happiness cannot be a function of, a, of, a, of just the bare physical body. It cannot be a function of a cake. It's a, it's a mental state. So it's, kind of interesting. it's the most primordial. Happy feelings are the most primordial way that virtue ripen. Do you understand? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, yes. Who is that? Juvi had a question. Where are you? You've disappeared. I'm here. Good, darling. Talk to me. Can you help me analyze a reaction from my reaction from daily life? Um, very quickly, yesterday I went to the post office to post something. The postal agent was there uh, busy. I got up first in line. There was something that was missing. So she asked me, I can't help you today. This is missing. So you got to come back. So then I went, did what needed to be done and went back today, like an hour ago. I was there. I was standing in line, went up to her. She looked at me and she said, it's still missing. I still can't help you. You have to step aside, do what's required. And I'm going to help the person behind you. So when I was ready, I went up to her and the person now who was in the front said, well, why don't you help her? So she said, she can wait. She can wait. I'm going to finish helping you first. I was so wearing a mask. So what's the question? Wearing a, pardon me? So the question? Question is, I looked at the gentleman and I said, thank you for your kindness. And I walked out. Was that attachment not getting what it wanted? Was it aversion? What did you feel by observing your mind? I was angry. <laughs> there you go. That's the answer. I mean, it's kind of, it's, I mean, normal daily life, of course, it's kind of 
we are like this, aren't we? You, you felt you were doing the right thing and she's being very blunt with you. She sends you off. You become a good girl. You come back again. And she says, she sends you off again and she can wait. So yes. So then you're going to argue there's some karma there between you and this person from yes. 27 lives ago, some little incident, but somehow even in spite of her wishes sometimes, this is how ka strong karma is. And I think we can see this ourselves. We meet some people that we just cannot stand. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? And we were shocked yeah. by it because there's some karma between us and that person. And you could actually say, one of the things they say is this, that the way in general, the way a person appears to us even is the fruit of the of their past karma. So the, if she, you appeared annoying to her, she didn't yeah. like you, she was a virgin, she was mean to you. So even that appearance of you being unkind is the fruit of one of your past negative actions. And that's why they say the body suffers, have such compassion because they know if a person is angry with them, they must have harmed them in the past. They have such compassion and wish and regret for their past action. So of course it was attachment and aversion, but you behaved nicely. You weren't mean, so you didn't, you didn't punch her in the nose. That's a good, that's a good, that's good. You, you made some progress. I sat in the, the car and I laughed and I thought about, yes. I have done something to her that That's is coming right. back to me. <laughs> That's exactly right. So it's, it's really simple things like this. This is what makes up our daily life, isn't it? It's really tricky, isn't it? So hard. Isn't it? The instinct yeah, hard. is so strong. We can, and it's such a good example because the instinct of attachment is so strong to only get the nice things. And it's so painful when we don't. Something as small as that, we can see. But this is what life consists of moments like this, isn't it? So it's really hard practice, isn't it? It is. Well done. You did a good you. job. You didn't abuse her. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> no, well done, girl. So, okay, how are we going there? Catherine, yes, talk to me. Hello, Venerable. Yes. Um, can we somehow, if we are angry with someone and don't act on it, can the mere fact that we are angry with them, can we somehow unintentionally then hurt them just by being angry? You know, if a person was very sensitive, Yes, you could. I think we, we see that with each other. You know, I think it's very curious, isn't it? You can walk into a room and be say, or you can cut the atmosphere like, an, with, like it was a knife because everybody's angry. They just, you know, even if you interrupt two people who have been fighting and they're totally silent, but you know there's anger in their mind. So it's, we, we are quite aware of that. So it can, if a person's very sensitive, they can feel it, you know, for sure. But I think... But yes, we can. I think if we're people are very sensitive, but at least we attempt not to say it. That's a really good start. It's really heavy once it comes out the mouth. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that's why we've got to do our best, finally. And we and, and we can see this. I mean, we know some people who are just really kind minds, just being in their presence makes us feel good. So we really can see we're quite suck, we're quite conduced, we're quite affected by even people's minds. It's pretty clear, I think. But at least you can't, but if you're doing your best not to be angry, then you really can't say you much create too much negative karma. Unless you're actually thinking, I hate that person, I wish they died, then it's quite heavy. But you don't, it's not as bad as saying it, you know. But their karma would still be theirs. I couldn't unintentionally hurt their karma, could I? Well, no, no, no. They have if they're hurt by it, that's theirs for sure. We all play our role. It's all very intricate, but if any of us feel anything or have any play in it, it's to do with what we've done, you know? Yeah, but it's all the trouble is we get so intertwined with it, we get very confused about whose job is what, you know? That's why it's so important to be very clear. All I can do is take care of my mind, my body and my speech, and then watch myself like a hawk and attempt to not harm others. And then you can't, I mean, you can't force people to like you. You can't force people to, to be kind to you. All we can do is work on ourselves, you know? It's a tricky one. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we're nearly finished. Suddenly an hour and a half has gone like a dream, as usual. Our four weeks have gone like a dream, as usual. We've made the most of it, I would say. So darling, yes. who wants to finish? Who wants to end with something? You yes, we'd like to go ahead. ahead. Yes, we'll go ahead and uh, do uh, off of the mandala now. And I'll go ahead and share the screen. So let's just talk before you do the sheets, before you finish. Oh. Let's okay, just here. Talk. Let's just finish right. with each other. Let's just talk to each other for a second. Okay. So I think um, I just want to say I'm amazed by all of you. Somehow you're so consistent coming week after week after week, you know. I think it's very amazing and very, and very marvelous. And I think even though it's quite intense, 
there's every month a new module. I think it's going in quite rich, you know. Don't you feel all you people? I think it's going in quite rich. So I think it's really fantastic. We really make the most of it. We really delight for ourselves and each other. And we just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You know, it's, it's just great. So what's our next module? Ah, I just froze. <laughs> Refuse in the three jewels. Three jewels, yes. Refuge in the three okay, good. Thank you, Lars. Okay, so that's, that'll be next. Okay, good. So we start that when? Next week? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So but I think, when will I be then? Let me just see where I'm going to be still on the same continent. I'm not sure where I'll be. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be, no, I'll still be in England. That's okay. I'll still be in England. And then the next week I'll be, and the next week I'll be back in America. So it'll be, um, it'll be 11, so it'll be timing for me, 11 in the morning for me. So you people, okay, so thank you so much, I'm everybody. In, here, I, I share the screen real quick. Not yet, I haven't finished, darling. Ah. Wait. A bit. So we just think, we just think, we just think, you know, how marvelous all this thinking we're doing, all this analysis, trying to make be clear, trying to understand what Buddhist teachings are, trying to understand how to apply them, how incredible. And the bottom line is what we're trying to do is be nicer people without harming others. This is pretty amazing. Consciously thinking, I want to become a better human being. It's pretty rare on this planet. So be very, very, very delighted. So then again, every tiny thought we've had sown seeds in the mind to maybe nourish these seeds from this moment forward so that we do develop our amazing potential so we really can be qualified to help others. So we'll sing the dedication prayer at the end, but now we can offer the mandala. And, and basically, it's a thank you for the teachings. Thinking like that, it's a thank you for the teachings, okay? And of course, we think we're thanking the Buddha. I'm just the mouthpiece. Okay, so imagine offering all the most marvelous things piled up high, and, and the, in the gompa, they're prostrating, and they're going to make offerings of the mandala for us on behalf, thanking the Buddha for his marvelous teaching, for these teachings, which I've been speaking, but we thank the Buddha, okay? Go on then, last. thank you so much. Sashi Pergi Juxing Meto Samri Rablingi Nidek Yan Padi Sangeshing to make Te Uwagi Dukun Namda Shingla Jerpak Shok Jetsun Lama Move the prayer up so we can all see it. Get your key color, to And now we imagine Buddha very happily receiving our offering. Hidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niyata Yami. And we just also, they offered very kindly in the Gompa, they offered representations of enlightened body, speech, and mind, so that we all achieve these as a result of all these, of these marvelous teachings. Thank you. So now we can um, do the refuge, the dedication prayers. The dedication prayers. That's it. Keep going. So we say in English, okay? So due to, I'm going to say more words, so just think. Due to the virtuous karmic seeds we have planted, every second listening to these teachings, may we quickly become the Guru Buddha and lead all suffering sentient beings without exception to that state. Next prayer. And may this precious, amazing attitude of Bodhicitta, which is this aspiration only to help others, not yet born in, in different minds, may it arise and may it grow. And then that which has arisen in the minds of others, may it never decline, but increase more and more. And so then we think of that we make a prayer for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Zodim Shemi, just say these words, the wish fulfilling, wish granting jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And in the land, and this is the next one, go to the next one, this one here. So the savior of the land of snow, teachings and transmigratory beings who extensively clarifies the path that unifies emptiness and compassion to the lotus holder, Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. 
to you who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplishes magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples. Please, please live long. Thank you, kind people, very kind. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. See you next week. Okay, keep moving. Give thank up. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody, everybody who's thank participating. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.